Did, uh, <clears throat> did anybody say the eclipse? The eclipse, was that much ado about nothing for you? All right. Well, uh, throughout human history, people from all walks, faiths, and backgrounds have tried to figure out exactly when the story of humanity and this world are going to end. And they have scoured ancient texts, looked for heavenly signs, and have made sweeping prophecies. Now, a week and a half ago, we had a heavenly event of sorts. At a quick glance, let me just take a look here. It would appear that you all wore those fancy glasses because all of your eyeballs seem to be intact. But I don't know where you were when you saw that, or maybe you didn't see it, or, or you, maybe you wore the glasses or did the box thing. I don't know how, how much attention you paid to the eclipse, but prior to the event, a number of people pointed out that there were some unusual occurrences that happened simultaneous to the eclipse. Maybe you haven't heard this. If not, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill this in for you. So maybe you didn't know that the great North American eclipse of 2024 occurred on the eve of the biblical Jewish calendar, which begins on Nisan 1 or April 9 of this year. Did, did you guys know that? Did you know it was on New Year's Eve from the... No. Well, okay. Lame. You guys are lame in your biblical scholarship. <laughs> How about this? Did you know that the eclipse ran a path opposite of an eclipse that happened seven years ago that formed a giant X? Or from another angle, a cross? Huh? Did you know that? Yeah, actually eclipses do that a lot, and it was actually six and a half years ago, but who's counting, right? Did you know that the eclipse crossed over a number of cities with biblical names? Like Nineveh. Did you know that? How about this? Did you know that when the eclipse, uh, the eclipse it crossed an area that is soon to see a massive explosion of insects, some would call locusts, although cicadas are not actually locusts, but it's going to happen this spring as two cicada broods emerge simultaneously. Huh? Did you know that? How about this? Did you know that uh, that, that there's actually a very unusual horned comet which is making an appearance and it only shows up every 71 years. Did you know that? All of those things happened about the same time as the great eclipse of 2024. You didn't know that, huh? You didn't go down the same weird rabbit holes that I went down related to the eclipse. Do you know what that means? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Uh, none of us do. But sometimes if you're around certain people, they are looking to find signs of the end of the world. But it did not seem that Jesus returned last week or week and a half ago because we're still here. Crowding lot is still par uh, 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 the parking lot is still crowded. It, Jesus is clearly not coming back yet. Now, some of you are the type of folks, or you grew up in a church that is constantly looking for signs in the heavens that the end might be near. Some of you, that you kind of grew up that way. Others of you completely and utterly ignore everything, and you think, ah, it's never going to happen. Who cares? Today, we're looking at a text that would say, don't freak yourself out and stare in the skies for signs, but also, don't ignore the fact that Jesus is going to return, because there's something really powerful and encouraging in that if you really pause and think about it. So today, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. If you haven't opened up to that uh, chapter, that verse already, uh, page 962. 962 in the Pew Bible in front of you is where we're going to be. And what you're going to notice is that this text does not tell us we should stare up into the skies with fancy glasses and we should not ignore the return of Jesus, but we need to be thinking about it. Now we're concluding our sermon series on chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, which is the longest section in the entire Bible on the subject of the resurrection. And what we've said from the beginning is that the resurrection, the fact that Jesus died in accordance with scriptures for our sins and rose again to life, is the thing of first importance when it comes to our faith. It's the first thing. Like, like, we can get hung up on a lot of other stuff, like uh, how do you interpret Song of Solomon, or, or, or how do you understand the creation accounts, or what about biblical archaeology, or, or whatever. We can get hung up on any number of things that are in the Bible. But what the Apostle Paul tells us is that the fact that Jesus came, he lived the life that we should have lived, he died the death that we deserve, and then he raised again to life. This 
is of first importance. This is the reason why, in some sense, some of us, many of us, Lord willing, it's why we are Christians. That Jesus died, was in the tomb, and on the third day rose again proves that Jesus was who he said he was and can do what he said he can do. It makes everything about Jesus matter tremendously, and it means that our faith is true. I, I read this quote to you a couple weeks ago. This is uh, C.S. Lewis in God in the Dock, and he says, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Our faith is not moderately important. It is infinitely important. And the resurrection sits at the very center of our faith. Now, the Apostle Paul would travel around. When he traveled around, he had sort of a, a technique for, for spreading the gospel. What he would do is he would go to primarily Jewish places because he had a Jewish background. He knew the Old Testament really well, so he'd go to synagogues and things like that. And he would start to share the message with Jewish people, and some of them would receive it, and some of them would reject. Well, after he'd sort of exhausted his time with the Jewish population in that city, he would then go to the Gentile areas, and he would go out into different areas and marketplaces, and he would start to talk to people, and he'd say, listen, I know that you're following, in, in, in this case in Corinth, you're following like Greek gods, like, you know, Zeus or Artemis or whatever. You're following these gods and they demand a lot of you and they take a lot from you. And in the end, they're just going to take your life and you keep worshiping them. But I want to tell you that there is a God who came to give his life for you. He's not, he's not asking just to take something for, from you. He's trying to give something to you. But you need to trust this Jesus with your life. And this Jesus that we worship, he says, this Jesus was resurrected. And he says, I can prove it. I can prove that Jesus was resurrected. He says, look at the scriptures. It was predicted. Look, look at the tomb. It's empty. Listen to the witnesses. He says, I can prove Jesus is alive. And some of the people that heard him were like, that's cool that you can prove Jesus is alive. But what does that prove to me? Like, like what difference does that make in my life. And so in chapter 15, the Apostle Paul is trying to prove it, and then he's trying to talk about, well, what that actually proves. So here's what we see starting in verse 50. Part one today is we're going to be seeing Paul point us to the glorious future, the glorious future. Here's what he says. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable, perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Here's what I want you to do for just a second. Think about your body. Think, just, just for a minute, just play along. Think about your body. The one that you have right now, not the one that you wish that you had or whatever. No, no. Think about your body right now. Consider its size and its abilities and its strength and its capacities, whatever. Think about your body. And here's the question. Do you like it? This is kind of a weird question, right? Do, do you like your body? I mean, just like this? Now, now, here's what I know. There are some of us, the answer is a resounding no. We're actually very frustrated by our bodies. We, we might be confused about our bodies. There are some of us here who may even hate our bodies, wishing that they looked different, worked better, or, or, or were different in some ways. And even thinking about our bodies gives us some angst or worse. Do do you fall in that category? Do you, do you like your body? Now, here's it. Here, 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 some of us are going, Ugh, no. Some of us are going, eh, it's okay. I mean, I like it fine, but it could be better. And as we start to think about what that means, we think through, you know, look, I, I, I'm thankful, I guess, that I have this degree of health, but the truth is there's a bunch of things about this body that don't look or don't work exactly the way that I would want. Like, they're weak in some areas, 
or our eyesight isn't exactly clear, or maybe our hands don't work the way that we want, or maybe we have aches and pains throughout our bodies, or maybe our memories are short, or our voices are strained, or we're shorter or skinnier or water, whatever than, than we want to be. And even those of us who are seemingly fit and have capable bodies, we all find flaws in our bodies. And when we think about if we like them, we go, even those of us that are like, yeah, they're okay. We're like, yeah, but they could be a lot, lot better. And here's the good news of the day. This wonderful body that you have, it's going to break down and die. It's, it's all downhill, folks. <laughs> to some degree, to some degree, each of our bodies, even the strongest among us, are going to fail us. We have these tremendously complex and unique and yet extremely limited bodies. They are gifts from God, but they are flawed. And there can be real discouragement there. Perhaps you remember there's there's a story in the Old Testament. It's um, about a guy named Job, and he has all this stuff going for him. And then uh, Satan's like, I'm going to test him. And God's like, go for it. And so Satan starts to take all the stuff from him. And so he loses a bunch of money and people die that he loves. And so he's grieving and all this stuff is happening. And, and Satan's like, yeah, that's not breaking his spirit. But you know what, Will? When I attack his body, because when his body hurts and when it starts to betray him, that's how I know I can get him truly discouraged. And the Apostle Paul here, he tries to encourage us. He says, listen, I tell you, brothers, I know some of you are frustrated with your bodies at times. I know some of you are in pain. I know some of you are misusing your bodies in inappropriate ways. I know that some of you are wishing that things could be different. But the body that you have is a gift from God, and it is for God. So use your body for God's glory. And despite all the limitations, serve God with it. And know this. Flesh and blood, the body that you have, which is meant to serve God, it's not going to last forever, but that's a good thing because the perishable body that you have cannot inherit the imperishable inheritance that is to come. Someday you will be given a body, a, a body better than you can imagine that will be able to enjoy and experience the wonderful kingdom that is to come. These perishable bodies are not equipped to enjoy the gift that God has for us. I mean, nobody would walk into a hospital room where there's a brand new baby and be like, oh baby, you're so sweet. I got you something. Here's the keys to a brand new truck. I hope you can drive a manual, right? It'd be like, that's ridiculous. They, they, they can't work a gear shift. They can't reach the pedals. Their body is not equipped to enjoy this gift. The Apostle Paul is saying, I want to encourage you for a second. Your body, even the best ones out there, cannot handle the goodness that is to come. And so God's going to give you a better one. You, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you are being promised a, perfect, a perfected body. In order to receive and enjoy the, this brilliant inheritance, we must be given these new bodies. And if you're thinking, okay, cool, so when does that happen? Well, he tells us, behold, I tell you a mystery, back to verse 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and the mortal body must put on immortality. When somebody dies... This is going to maybe be hard for us to wrap our heads around, but when somebody dies, they are immediately with Jesus. There's this thief on the cross, and Jesus says, you're going to die today, and today you'll be with me in paradise. You get, some of you may remember that. And then, and then in Philippians 1, the Apostle Paul is like, man, I, if I die, I get to be with Jesus like right now. And so in the Bible, it tells us that when we die, we are immediately in the presence of Jesus in paradise, whatever that means. But it does not tell us that as soon as we die, we get resurrected bodies. That actually takes a while. There's actually like kind of two stages to resurrection. Have you guys ever thought about this before? Like as you read through the Bible, especially texts like this, what you see is that when you die, you are immediately in some way with Jesus. But you are not yet in your glorified body. Your glorified body isn't given to you until Jesus returns. 
And for those of us who are alive when Jesus returns, what we find out is that we get our glorified bodies at that time. So everybody, whether they had already died or they're still alive, when Jesus returns, that's when we get these new, perfected, imperishable bodies that can enjoy fully and experience the new creation. And you might wonder, well, when is Jesus going to return? Well, not at the eclipse of 2024. (laughs) We can say that much for sure. And again, I think there's a temptation for some of us to become overly obsessed and even frightened about the fact that Jesus is going to return. I was talking with one of our elders today, and he said, oh, it'd be great if Jesus returned today. I said, yeah. And he goes, but do you really want him to return before your sabbatical? And I was like, oh, (laughs) good point. (laughs) Or before the building opens, or like one day before the new building, and then Jesus like, I'm here. And I'm like, okay, that's still better, but (laughs) I'll just point at it as we go by. But some of us, we can actually freak ourselves out, like, oh, maybe this is the end, you know, and we start. Our, Our church offices, on occasion, receive letters of doom from somebody who's been reading the signs and they send us texts that are all marked up and very highlighted and it's oh there's a lot of these and thou's for some reason and it's warning us like the end is here and I'm like okay I, I mean last I checked Jesus in Matthew 24 said concerning the day and the hour no one knows Not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but the Father only. So when will it happen? Jesus says, nobody knows that for sure. Right after Jesus was resurrected, he meets his disciples, and they're hanging out. And and, and so for a few days, he's ministering to them and all that. And then we get to this point in Acts, and and I love this. This is one of my favorite verses, uh, because we're at this point in Acts. And then Jesus ascends up to heaven, and all the disciples, like, see him go, and they're like, and they're just standing there. They're just staring at the skies. And as they're staring at the skies, an angel shows up and says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, he says, Don't just stand there looking for signs. You got work to do. He's going to come back. You're not going to miss him. A trump's going to sound, whatever. Trumpet, not trump. Trumpet is going to sound. He said, don't, don't like be freaking yourself out and staring at it because if you look too long for signs, you're going to see something that may or may not be there. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever gone hunting before, and I know that's a terrible Ann Arbor illustration. I don't know how many of you have gone bird watching before. Uh, <laughs> birding. But if you stare hard enough, looking for a fancy bird that you wouldn't kill, but you just want to see it. (laughs) If you look hard enough, then every twig and every leaf and every movement becomes a bird. And you actually miss what's truly happening. And some of us, we grew up in systems or we went to churches or maybe it's just we we have a type of anxiety about it that we're like constantly, oh, is this it? Is this it? And we're trying to read every sign. and That's an X pattern in the city of Nineveh and blah, blah, blah and all this stuff. Relax. Here's what we can say for sure. The eclipse of 2024 brought us one day closer to the return of Christ. Oh, we can say that about today also, by the way. In fact, every day that we're on this earth is bringing us one day closer to the return of Christ. And when he returns, there will be a trumpet blast that we won't miss. And he will come and he will set things right in this world. And the struggle and the pain and the frustrations of this world and the bodies that are, that are being broken down, he's going to come and he's going to make it all right. And our bodies will be strong and steady and pain-free. And that will be the case for everybody who's ever trusted Jesus. So that grandmother of mine whose mind and body faded, she'll be restored. She will be given a strong, perfected mind. The grandfather of mine who I never met because his heart gave out long before I was even born, I will meet him and his heart will be strong. The loved ones that we have who've been ravaged by disease, the friends who've been gone too soon, martyrs who were burned at the stake, when Jesus returns, they and we will be given perfected bodies. We will be like strong oak trees, where we were once mere acorns. The human story starts 
with Eden. It's this masterpiece, and Jesus is going to make it all right again. That is our glorious future. That's part one. Part two, there's a taunt song here, a diss track, if you will. This is what he goes on to say. He says, listen, we live in this world where for now death taunts us. Death sings songs over us. I try to think of what song that would be. I can't, that is a Rolling Stone song, Time is on My Side. You might know that song. Death kind of sings that at us and it sort of laughs at us and it watches as we cry and we grieve and our bodies break down because there's this sin in all of us that moves us towards death. And so our gardens grow weeds, our crops die, our machines rust, our tech breaks down, our homes rot, our roads crumble, our pets pass away, our bodies stoop, and death is there laughing and mocking us the whole way. Even the wonderful, perfect law of God that points us to the way of flourishing in life, even that ends up sort of nudging us in a direction towards sin and death. It's like knowing the rules of God actually make us want to break them and embrace sin all the more. Uh, a few months ago, um, uh, Todd, who's our youth pastor, told a story here of, of a hotel in Texas that was pretty close to the water, and they were afraid that people would fish from the balcony. Maybe some of you remember this illustration he gave. And they were afraid people were going to fish from the balcony, and if they did so, maybe their sinkers and lures would come back and hit the glass on the balcony and break it. And so they put up signs everywhere saying, you know, no fishing allowed, no fishing allowed. Well, sure enough, a bunch of glass was broken because people were fishing from it. And they thought, how can we stop people from breaking the glass in the hotel? We've already put signs and they're not listing. And then they thought, ooh, I got an idea. Let's remove the signs. Because as soon as you remove the signs, people won't even have the idea of breaking that particular rule. And sure enough, they removed the signs and no glass was getting broken because it was the rule that almost gave people the idea to break the law. Now, even though we know that sin leads us to death, instead of running from sin, we find ourselves sinning more and more and more, even when we know that God's law tells us not to. And while we're breaking the law, and while death is out there, it is just merrily whistling its song and singing at us like, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. Now, I don't know if you've been to a funeral uh, recently, but a lot of times, it, 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 kind of a new trend with funerals is to call them a celebration of life rather than a funeral. And I understand that. I, like, I get where that impulse is coming from because we don't want to let death win. We want to focus on the gifts and the goodness of a person's life rather than to be faced directly with the sadness of their death. But the truth is, whether we call it a celebration of life or memorial or a funeral, death hurts badly. And it has been singing and taunting us for all, all time since Adam and Eve. It has this poison of sin that's running through our veins, and it knows that everything we touch is breaking down. And so death hurts but it doesn't get the last word. The Apostle Paul says, here's what the last word is going to be. Here's what happens. Here's the taunt song we get to sing when Jesus returns. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, verse 54, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When our glorious future resurrection happens, when those promises arrive, then we will get to sing a song back at death. It will get really quiet as we start to tell it, oh yeah, guess what? You don't win anymore. There, there's a moment in a basketball game uh, that went kind of viral a day or two ago. And uh, there's a young guy who plays for the Wolves. His name's Anthony Edwards, and he's a very good basketball player. And he was playing on a court with Kevin Durant, who's been one of the best players for like the past 10 or 15 years or whatever. Anyway, Anthony Edwards, who had idolized Kevin Durant for years and years and years, his team, and he in particular, was getting the best 
of the sons and Kevin Durant's team. And so there's this moment, just this beautiful moment, where he's jogging backwards down the court after scoring some amazingly impressive basket. And Kevin Durant is right in front of his face, and he is just chirping. I mean, he's just, that means trash talking or speaking competitively, for those of you not in the sports world. And he's just like, he's just like smiling. He's like, yeah, I wasn't trying to read his lips because I don't know what's going on there. But it was so clear, like the competitive fire, the joy, this moment of, I got you. You can't hold me. You can't stop me anymore. It's my time now. The Apostle Paul says, when Jesus returns... You can just look at death and be like, yeah, nice try. Too small. Too small. Like, like you've got nothing on me. You can't cause me to weep or cry. There's not another funeral that I'm ever going to attend. Instead, the viper is defanged and the song is strangled in its throat and the head of the serpent is crushed and death is done. My sons showed me this uh, ridiculous... YouTube guy um, who just sort of walks around the Everglades in Florida barefoot and just snags creatures. Some of y'all have seen this apparently, but he just like grabs creatures that would freak me out and he just goes yoink and he just like, oh, there's a lizard, yoink, and it's it's like biting him. He's like, oh, nice teeth, lizard, or whatever, and he sets it down. Or he sees like a large scary snake and he yoink and he grabs it and whips it around his shoulders and he's just sort of playing with the snake. Or, or he goes, oh, there's a swamp puppy, which is what he calls alligators. <laughs> and he goes, you want to give me a kiss? And like smack it on the nose. And he's so incredibly cavalier. It's like, this can't hurt me. Guess what? There will come a day. There will come a day when sin, disease, demonic power, addiction, death, where you can be like, Yo, I, you can't touch me. Where, oh death, where, oh death, is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? When Jesus returns, there will never be a need for us to mourn another loved one, to receive another terrible phone call with bad news, to have another scan for a disease or hear of another tragic accident or have another ache or a pain or a broken bone or a hangnail or a tumor or a knee replacement or an accident or a kidney stone or anything. Death, decay, darkness. It will be banished by the glorious Son of God and we will be given glorified bodies to enjoy this reality forever. For now, there will be pain, death, and grief, but it won't be this way forever. Maybe you've heard this, but... For those of us who believe in Jesus, this is as close to hell as we'll ever be. Of course, for those that don't believe in Jesus, this is as close to heaven as you ever get. But for those of us who believe in Jesus, this is as close to hell as we'll ever be. And there's a glorious future and a taunt song that is awaiting us. Part three, daily challenge, daily challenge. With this promise of the glorious future and the taunt that we will someday get to sing over death, it might be easy to imagine that Paul's next words would be something like, hey guys, so because heaven's so awesome, just daydream about it and you don't have to do anything else. Just ignore your crabby neighbors. Just don't try to serve anybody. Just forget about that because someday, someday you'll get to escape all this. But that's not what he says. What he says in verse 58 is this. Therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He says, therefore, in light of this future, you are to do something now. It isn't that you're supposed to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. No, it's the opposite. It's that when we truly believe that the resurrection happened to Jesus... And by faith, it will happen to all of us. Then we can become so heavenly minded that we can start to be actually good. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said this, A continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. 
It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set foot the conversion of the Roman Empire. The great men who built up the Middle Ages. The English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since, Christ has, uh, since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Our response to all this resurrection talk ought to be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain. In fact, everything you do should be given meaning by, by the reality that someday you and I will get these glorified bodies. I mean, if you imagine two men being thrown into a dungeon to serve 10-year sentences for hard labor, and one of them before he goes in is told by his wife and children, I won't be there for you, and it's all over, and we're done, his next years in prison are going to be pretty awful. But if the second man is going to prison in a dungeon for 10 years and his wife and children say, we will be here for you and we'll have a glorious reunion at the end of this, it would give everything that he does meaning and purpose and peace and joy. That is how we are supposed to live. To live out our faith now in light of the end. Peter says this in 1 Peter 4. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, get your guns. And your rations. And your bomb shelters. And make sure that you can survive the zombie apocalypse that is to come. Well, he, doesn't, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, look out for number one. What does he say? He believed that the end of all things was at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep stashing gold because that's the only thing that will have any value in the last. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. In 2 Peter, he says it this way. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The world is ending. Live for Jesus today. Pursue holiness and love one another earnestly. If we are in the last days, as we're supposed to believe, then we should seek to live out the gospel message. As people are spiraling into distraction and confusion, we are to be steadfast, self-controlled, sober-minded, prayerful, hospitable. As we get ready to leave today, here's the question that I want to leave us with. What do you want to be found doing when Jesus returns? He's going to return. You're going to get a glorified body. That's awesome. You get to sing a taunt song. Also awesome. But what do you want to be found doing when Jesus returns? I want to close with this quote from John Piper because he answers this question in a really cool way. He said, I want to be at a bedside loving a sick person. I want to be in the city working for the poor. I want to be in the pulpit, God willing, preaching a sermon. I don't want to be staring into the sky like that is some godly thing to do. Oh, that we might be found doing the works of righteousness when he comes and, and then sleeping after a nice hard day of well done work. That would be a nice way to meet him. Here he says, the cry goes out. He is here. Go meet him. Let your lamps burn brightly with life, joy, faith, hope, love, expectancy, praise, wonder, marvel. This is going to happen, folks. Jesus is going to come back someday. So what do you want to be found doing when he returns? Hating your body? Frustrated? Distracted? No. Serve him in a steadfast way. Let's pray. Father, Whenever we think about uh, the things that can discourage us, like our bodies or or the struggles and the diseases and the pains that loved ones have or even the grief that we might be facing, it is very easy to sort of begin to spiral. Father, would you give us a a spirit of steadfast 
love and faithfulness. Would you allow us, even in moments like this, to to have our hearts awakened to the truth that someday we're going to have this incredible inheritance and these perfected bodies with which to enjoy it. God, keep that before our eyes now so that we, we might walk and witness to others with whom we have any sorts of interaction. That, that we would be lights and mirrors showing away the way to the glorious future you have for each of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's stand so we can sing.
amen to that. Let's somehow, as we leave today, combine that thought, that reality, and have the childlike faith of a little Zion Vossler looking forward to that day when our faith will be sight and we see Jesus return and we spend forever with him, but also keeping in mind what is it that we want to be doing when Jesus does return? How do we want to be found at that moment? Let's leave remembering those two realities and put them together in a beautiful way. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you filled out an orange card as a new person, thank you so much for doing that. Be sure to drop it in a fishbowl on your way out. We we'll look forward to connecting with you. Thanks for being with us today. Earlier in the service, Pastor Tyson had a little bit of a Freudian slip when he said that we have a crowding lot out there rather than a parking lot. And so here in a few moments when we dismiss, if you would go, if you have children in Grace Kids Ministry, pick them up right away and, and head on out of here. That helps us as we prepare for our 11 o'clock uh, crowds as well. But thank you so much for being with us. We love you. We need you. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Have a great day. Thank you.